right. Good morning. Welcome to LifePoint Crossing. My name is Ross. I'm so glad you are here. Being a regular, consistent part of the church is the greatest way to start your week every week. So, yes, sir. I, oh, we're just getting started. Hey, uh, this is going to be probably not exactly every one of us, but probably most of us. Uh, two things about me. I am largely a product of our society's educational system, number one. And number two, I see a fair amount of criticism of our society's educational system. Uh, my life unfolded in such a way that with just like a three-year break in between college and seminary, where I got married and just lived a little bit of life, I got out of seminary about 29 years old, and except for that three-year period, pretty well my entire life that I could remember was school. So I saw a lot, and there's a lot of good in it. And there is also some validity, I think, to some of the criticisms. So here's one that you may have come across. I'm glad school taught me the Pythagorean theorem instead of how to do my taxes. It's come in really handy this Pythagorean theorem season. It's a little bit snarky, but it does make a certain point. I, I, it's hard to justify the privileged place that a squared plus b squared equals c squared has in probably all of our minds relative to how powerful it is in our daily lives, yet taxes, which every one of us has to do, and I know there's differences in how government stuff does stuff, but the, the taxes that are levied by the same government that effectively runs the school, and if we get those wrong, it costs us money and, and probably penalties and, and fees, or if it's bad enough, you go to jail. That's every one of us. And so it seems like if one of these really was more important than the other, like, I, don't, I don't, yeah, maybe, maybe the Pythagorean theorem wasn't quite as useful as some other things could have been. Here's another one that's kind of similar, but a little bit funny. I didn't know how to get a job. I didn't know how to pay taxes. All I know is that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Does anybody else remember that exact phrase from school? I see at least one hand from the person who, the only one I know who actually did well in school. Um, but I don't know, maybe it was just my science textbook, but I, that exact same phrase, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. I don't even know what a mitochondria is. If it came and introduced itself to me or if I saw it under a microscope, like I'm glad that's a part of our broader human knowledge because I'm sure it's very, very helpful if you're in like, molecular biology or something, but that basically none of us went into. But, but I don't even, I just know that when I see or hear the word mitochondria, my bridge has a permanent, or excuse me, my mind has a permanent bridge built in between that and just this phrase, the powerhouse of the cell. I don't even know what that means. And so I'm a believer in education. My mom was a public school teacher. I think knowledge is good, understanding is better. Wisdom is maybe one of the most valuable things on the planet. I know that our educational system is way, way, way better than the vast majority in the world, so I'm not trying to be all whatever. But it does seem like our educational system is kind of built on the idea that you just kind of learn things enough so that you can put them on the test at the end of the semester, and then, you know, you, you do well. So I can still tell you about the Pythagorean theorem and mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, but I've never had to really do anything with those. Maybe it would be different if I had gone into math or carpentry or architecture or molecular biology, but most of us didn't, and every one of us has to pay taxes. So we just had to learn, and then as long as we learned enough to put it on the test, then we were told that we did well and we were rewarded. Well, I don't know exactly if this is the case, but I suspect that perhaps the way we were taught and learned in school has impacted the way that we're taught and learn in the church or even just sort of generally following Jesus, right? We value belief and understanding because those are valuable. They are, but they're not the goal, right? We, we, um, there, there are steps toward the goal. There, it helps to understand what the goal is. You're for sure never going to reach the goal if you don't even know what it is or how to get there, but just knowing what the goal is if you're not moving toward it that hasn't really helped you much, has it? And so in following Jesus, we reward knowing the right answers, and you can find it in the Bible, and, and that's really good. That's really helpful. Um, but we, don't mis we mistake it for the goal. The person who can sometimes best describe or understand from Scripture the way to the goal is held up as the model or the, the one who's very mature or very deep, but it's just not helpful unless you're 
moving there. And so what James has to say for today is that really all of us, like we know enough to start moving toward the goal, but you, you have to actually go. Don't just start. So what, what he's going to say is like, don't, don't stop at the start. And, and this is coming from James 1, chapter 9. And here's what he's going to say. He's going to say, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must, be, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Less than a year ago, we did a whole six-week series on how to have a conversation, if you were here for that. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. That's interesting. Uh, not probably surprising to a lot of us, but it looks like righteousness is a very important piece of the goal here. And so what do you do? Well, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. And humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. Okay, Kind of another message for another day, but what is filth and evil in your life? Well, based on everything in James and even the next sentence, probably what scripture would describe as filth and evil in your life, because he talks about God's word, right? Don't, don't, but don't just listen to God's word. In other words, don't stop at the start. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling, definitely not God. You're only fooling yourselves. He says, for if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. To know something and not take action is really no better than if you didn't know it in the first place. And so he says, but if you look into the, carefully into the, the perfect law, which, by the way, which sets you free... It's good. And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Well, that sounds more positive. Now, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling, again, only yourself and your religion is worthless. Okay, so then what? Well, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you, which is interesting. He takes two things here, and there's like a positive and a negative. There's a do and a don't do. There's, there's do, take care of people who aren't able to take care of themselves. Widows and orphans were even more vulnerable in their society than they are in ours. And so like do that. There's something good to do. Do, do that. And then there's also a negative, a don't do. There's a don't let the world corrupt you. And so what he's saying is, is these things, the, the do and the don't do, these are going to be the natural overflow of your faith and the beliefs. If all you have is the right knowledge and the right answers, I mean, you might as well not. And most of you know, and this is your first or maybe second week here at LifePoint Crossing, that at the, the end of the message, every week I lead through a short gospel presentation and a little prayer of belief in and commitment to, to Jesus Christ, uh, to, to God through Jesus. And on some level, this is what James is talking about, right? He used the phrase, power to save your souls. But if you pay attention, you may have also noticed that immediately after I, tr I try to address something very directly that, that I think is important, which is so easy to misunderstand or get wrong and then causes problems, and it's that, well, that what you do isn't what saves you. It's God that saves you. The words or the prayer can't save you. What you're saved by is God's grace, right? Which comes to you through your faith. And I think this is very important because if we get this a little bit wrong, it's, it's very, very subtle, but it can really lead us to the wrong conclusion that we are saved by our faith, that it's our faith that saves us. That's not true. It's God's grace that saves us, which comes to us through our faith, which is very, very important then. It's still vital. I think of it a little bit like if you were in the hospital and you're in rough shape. You're in rough shape. But they give you some medication through an IV, and you know sometimes we just use words with a little bit of imprecision just because that's kind of what we do. But you might say, oh, this IV saved me. And we would all understand what you did and what you didn't mean. But really what saved you was the medication that came through the IV. The IV was just the conduit which delivered it, allowed it to be delivered to you. So God's grace is the medication, right? In our, in our faith is the IV. And so it's, it's a vital link because if the IV has a block or a hole in it and the medication can't get to you, 
well, then it's no good. You, you, you can die. Well, can that kind of an IV save you? So what kind of a faith do you have? Let me skip over a few verses. And he says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but there's no evidence of it. You don't show it by your actions. Can that kind of a faith save anyone? How's your IV? Is it intact and functional? Or is there some sort of a block in there? So suppose you, you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Obvious expected answer, not much. So it says, so you see, faith, by itself, like when you say you have faith, that isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, there's evidence of it, it's dead and useless. useless. If your faith is in your faith and doesn't spill over into the way you live, then James is not impressed by your empty IV tube. If the IV is delivering life-saving medication, there will be change in the patient. If your faith is good and viable, there will be change in your life. And now someone may argue, okay, well, well you know, some people have faith and, and others have good deeds. Okay, but I say, well, how can you show me your faith? What evidence is there if you don't have any good deeds? I'll show you my faith by my good deeds if there's no evidence of the medicine in your vital signs. It might be time to question the value of the medication, if there's no evidence of your faith in your life, it might be time to, to question the value of, of your faith. It says, you say you have faith, right? for you believe that there's one God, which is good. That's the right thing to believe. You're, you're correct. Good for you. But it doesn't get you that far. Even the de demons believe this, and, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? And let me, let me try and be as clear as I can, because this is actually the kind, of, the kind of thing and the kind of message that I get really nervous about somebody misunderstanding a little bit, and uh, a little bit of misunderstanding can take us a long way off course in regard to your forgiveness, salvation, and adoption as children in God's family. You don't do it. You can never do enough good. You can never be good enough. You are saved by God. God and his grace that comes to you through your faith, full stop. There's not a tension of you have a, a, little bit of, a little bit of faith and a little bit of works, and then they kind of work together. It's not, I do my part and God does God's part. That's heresy. God does it. You're saved by God and his grace. Just to clarify, there are a million places you could go in Scripture to, to see this very, very clearly and explicitly, but just for clarity and maybe a little bit of fun, we'll go to Paul in Romans 4, which I maybe have my own kind of understanding of fun, but he's going to talk about Abraham. It'll be fun, for, for some of us at least. For, uh, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Was it because of what he did? Well, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But no, that was not God's way. So if the scriptures tell us, in it's an Old Testament citation, Abraham believed God and God saved him. God counted him as righteous because of his faith, which was evidenced in that he believed God. Now, this from James today, this is important. This is not a pushback on what Paul is saying in Romans or many, many, many other places in Scripture. Here's what this is from James. Is he, what he's talking about then is the natural outflow. Receiving grace through faith is the start. But don't stop at the start. Where the medicine is applied healing results, where grace is received, life transformation happens. This isn't saying that if you have faith, you, you have to then go and add some works to that faith. It's saying that if you have to add works to your faith, then you don't really have the right faith in the first place. If you have really the right faith in, faith in the first place, you don't have to add works to it. Works will naturally, inevitably result from that. If you said a prayer and believed in Jesus so that you wouldn't go to hell, but your life didn't change, yeah, it might be time to question whether you even got to the start. James has an example. 
He says, don't you remember that, look, he's talking about the same Abraham that, that Paul just was in Romans. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right, the evidence of his faith by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete, and it happened just as the scriptures say. And look at this exact same verse that James cites that Paul just cited a minute ago. See, this is where it gets fun, right? Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The exact same verse that Paul cited to demonstrate that it wasn't what Abraham did that made him right with God. Here, James cites to demonstrate that although Oh, it wasn't what he did that made him right. The things that he did did result from his faith. Isn't that fun? So he was even called the friend of God. So you see, we're shown to be right, the evidence with God by what we do, not by faith alone. I hope that's as clear as can be, and I don't have to explain it a lot further. Um, but then what do you do? Because here would be my first reflex in hearing or reading something this, like this, I would say, okay, well, then I guess I better go do some stuff right, to make sure that I have the right kind of faith. I don't know if that's how you would hear that or how you would react, but that's probably how I would. But I don't think it's a lot better. Here, here's what I mean. If you say you love the Chiefs, and I know a lot of you do, and I don't care if you don't, right? I'm not saying like you need to love the Chiefs, but I know a lot of you say you love the Chiefs. It would be really weird if you then every weekend during football season you said, well, I say I'm a Chiefs fan, so I guess I'd better carve out a couple hours to watch the game. That's what Chiefs fans do. It'd be strange. If you love the Chiefs, you are intentionally working to keep that time slot clear so that you can watch the Chiefs because you want to watch the Chiefs. It's part of why we don't have church on Sunday afternoon, is you'd all find another church where you wouldn't have to choose between the two. And that's okay. I wouldn't even be mad at you. You wouldn't, like, don't sacrifice. I, I know you love Jesus, but you also love the chiefs. That's okay. Find, find a church where you can do both. And in fact, the fact that you, have, that you, you come to this church and that you keep your schedule che clear, that you keep chiefs time open for chiefs time, is a very clear evidence that you do love the Chiefs. It would be really strange if you just said, ah, uh, I mean, I watch the Chiefs because that's, I mean, I say, I say I'm a fan. And I'm not at all, please, I'm not trying to in any way correlate like church and God. But I do think we have a lot of people probably around who just, like say they're Chiefs fans, but really they just kind of grew up in Kansas City. And so they're they're not Broncos fans. I mean, they're definitely not Raiders fans. They have a couple t-shirts that they got at Christmas. Uh, they'll watch pieces of a game here or there. It's fun when they go to the Super Bowl, but it's not really that they love the Chiefs. It's that they just kind of grew up around Kansas City, which is okay. You don't have, you know, obviously a value neutral sort of endeavor. But I also think we have a lot of people maybe just kind of grew up around the church or Christianity, and, and that's an incredible, Incredible benefit and privilege. I, I think a child can call on God in faith and be made new. I think that was me as a child. But there can be, as is almost always the case, there can be a danger. When, when we hear about God's love and Jesus' sacrifice and human sinfulness from a young age and many times, like I did, and again, it's, it's a wonderful privilege, but it is possible then that the most remarkable thing in the history of the universe can kind of start to sound normal. Kind of not that remarkable. And, and, and so you're taught and you believe, you believe enough at least, and the preacher said, well, you know, just say this prayer and call on God and you're forgiven forever. And so he said, okay, well, I mean, you know, that sounds good. Probably I'd be a fool not to. But the only thing that really changed is how you feel about your soul. And then there are churches exactly like this one that tell you exactly correctly that it's not what you do that makes you right with God. And so you kind of do the math in your head and you say, so, all right, I guess that means... You know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. And so I'll, you know, go to church, you know, every week or on occasion or whatever, however that plays out for you because I'm a Christian. And I guess that's what you do. But that's really about, about where it stops. It doesn't sound, that sound like your faith is a lot like the person who's, who, who says they have faith, but that then James says that that's really basically worthless. The only one fooled is you. 
And so I, part of me hopes that this is a little bit frightening for some of us. If you're a little bit frightened by this, honestly, I think that's a great sign, right? And, and, if, and if you think that is you, listen, here's what you do. In, it's so simple. You just throw yourself at the mercy of God and receive his grace. Your sins put you at odds with your creator, but Jesus has taken your punishment. I know you've heard it a thousand times, but if you have, and I hope you have, but if you understand this, it changes you. If you understand this, I think the only possible response is to say, oh God, I... I can never repay you. It would be an insult to even try, but out of love and gratitude, I, I cannot possibly keep on going on the same way that I was, and, and so I serve you. And the entire trajectory of your life changes, and, and it goes from serving yourself and whatever you would like to, to out of love and gratitude, once again, to serving the God of the universe who did the most universe-shattering thing in the history of the universe by giving himself to love and save you. To be clear, that doesn't mean you necessarily quit your job and become a pastor or anything of that, but, but your life fundamentally changes, and, and it doesn't mean that you immediately become a finished product. Growth comes in steps and stages, and, and you're not immediately, you'll probably never be a finished product on this earth. But if God isn't changing your life, ah, what kind of faith is that? And some of you probably are sitting here thinking, well, I, I mean, I think I have, I think I'm right with God. But I, I, how, how, how do I know? How, how, how am I? And of course, no one can really see into anybody else's heart. But here, I think, are some, some very, very helpful questions to ask. Are you grieved by your sin? Right? Not do you have any sin. I know you have sin. But there was a time when you would sin and it didn't bother you. You still had a conscience. You still knew right and wrong. Maybe if you did something and it hurt somebody, then that really felt bad to you. So you said, okay, well, I don't want to do that again. But it had nothing to do with God. Are, are you grieved? Not, not guilty because you're forgiven, but, but are you grieved because your sin is against the perfect and holy God who gave himself to love you and to save you? If so, that's a good sign. If it doesn't really bother you, well, that's not really a good sign. Do you fight against your sin? Now, I know you don't win every time, but do you fight against what you know is wrong? If so, that's a good sign. If you say, well, okay, it's forgiven, so it doesn't really matter, right? Oh, it's not a good sign. There's a question, what do you think of when you think of God? If you think of his greatness and his glory and how unbelievable it is that he is the God of the universe at great personal cost, has chosen to be your heavenly father, and so all you can do is just be filled with love and gratitude. And, and listen, that's not to say that you live decades of your life at a time in some heightened emotional state. That's not any human being. But if, if you think of that, that's a great sign. If you, if you think of God as the big guy who you just kind of want to stay away from his bad side, well, that's not such a good sign. And of course, what James has been talking about, has, has God changed how you live? Is there evidence, not to prove to me or yourself or anybody else, but is there evidence that the patient is receiving the medication? Following Jesus isn't saying a prayer and coming to church when it's convenient. It is a life and eternity transformation. And so belief is the start. Faith is the start. But don't stop at the start. Get rid of the filth and the evil in your life. If you don't know what that is, you open your Bible, come talk to me. Uh, but, and just as much as getting rid of evil, do something good. Let, let your faith overflow into your life and be expressed in the real world. What you do isn't going to save you. But when we're saved... There's going to be some things done. Love and serve your spouse. Obey and honor your parents. Take care of people who can't take care of themselves. Use some of the money that God's entrusted to you for godly good. The list is infinite, and so are your possibilities. Go. You didn't, you didn't get to the starting line just to be at the starting line, 
right? You didn't, I hope you didn't come to church just to check off the box that said, come to church through Jesus, the God of the universe has done the most incredible thing that you could ever conceive to love and save you. And I know you might have heard it a thousand times, but maybe today you'll let this one be the one where you, you don't just understand, but you respond. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. There is absolutely nothing that we can do to make ourselves right with you. We know as well as you do that we would mess it up. We would do something wrong. We would do what we tend to do as fleshly, fallen, sinful human beings. Father, thank you that you love us through that and that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And if you're here today still praying and you've never taken that first step to throw yourself at the mercy of God and receive his grace, this is your day. Your moment is now. If you're here in person, if you're watching online, whatever the case may be, you just pray and say it to God. You can say it out loud or even in your heart, just talk to God. He'll hear you say, God, I believe that Jesus came and died and resurrected so that I could be forgiven and be adopted as a child in your family. Please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be. And give me the life that you have for me. And as always, if you say that prayer, that's not the words or the prayer that saves you, it's that you put your faith in God. Uh, in, in Jesus, God responds to that, and you are a new spiritual creation, forgiven and adopted. And the best thing you can do is to, you're, you're not intended to live your new life in Jesus alone. Let somebody know. You can go back to the point. There's a person there to let them know who you are. We'll be able to follow up with some good, healthy next steps in following Jesus. Or uh, if, you're, if you're here, if you're, if you're online, send us a message. It, it'll be the same. Listen, for those of us who maybe we, this is the thousandth, thousandth time for us. But man, maybe sometimes it just gets like you've heard it 999 times before. I know, I know, life gets busy. You end up doing your things. What is it that the Spirit's speaking to you? What, what step can you take to move back into the life that he has for you, to let that faith overflow? You know that you have faith in the real God, that he's forgiven and adopted you. You're his child. Will you let that back into your life in a real and meaningful way, that you are his, your life is his, and what can we possibly do but throw ourselves at him in love and in gratefulness and offer every bit of our lives for his glory in love and in gratitude. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us a life, that you've given us a chance to live a life for something bigger than ourselves and for your glory. We ask for your spirit's empowerment as we seek to be and become more of who you have created us to be today and through this week and on for as many days as you give us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.